Hey, are we live? Anyone tuned in? Can you give me a yes or a no if you can see me? Okay, so I'm told this is on. So good evening, everybody. Wonderful to be here with you today. I'm here to speak about, yes, now I can see the comments also. Hi, Govind. Hi, Sanjay. Harshil. Hello. Great. Great. So today I'm here to speak about my book, Rome uh, Flirting with Stocks. Uh, now let's see what can I tell you and of course at the end if there are any questions I can answer those. Uh, I First let me start with why I wrote this book. Don't ask me why I called it Flirting with Stocks because that is the trend of the names of my books. We've got Romancing the Balance Sheet and Flirting with Stocks and I on the Bottom Line and so on. Folks, Flirting with Stocks is stock market for beginners. If you are already a stalwart perhaps there's nothing that you can learn from here but for beginners the idea is to ease you into stock market many people find stock market and terms connected with it intimidating whereas it's such a fascinating place in fact i i may not be the right person to have written this book because i'm not a broker i don't give professional advice um, on where to invest. I don't give tips. So in your question, don't ask me about tips, please. Uh, but stock market is very close to my heart. A statement that I make very often. Yes, Jay, titles are <laughs> somehow, you know, some people perceive that finance are the subject to be drab. So I feel let's first start making it undrab right from the title onwards. And then from the looks of the books, you know, the covers and so on. Uh, so that if people don't open the book, how will they know how fascinating the subject is? They may look at the cover or they may look at the title and leave it on the bookshelf. So uh, there are some beautiful anecdotes you have given in the book. I, I'll speak about the anecdotes also subject to time. Guys, somebody please remind me that the time is up so that I can stop. Once I start, I tend to go on. I'm a teacher by passion. So it might become difficult to stop me if you don't remind me that it's time to stop. So I was saying, you know, stock market, I have always had a fascination for and I believe that everybody should invest. I have often made a statement that investing in stocks is a national duty. So very often people say, what do you mean it's a national duty? So let me start with that. Why do I say investing in stock market is a national duty? You know, an example I often give is, let's say I come to you with a brilliant investment idea that you know I have this wonderful idea I can make the best mouse trap in the world or I can make the best rocket in the world or any product I've got a great idea this product can make millions and billions in profit but I don't have the money I come to you you have the money and I say why don't you put your money with me your money my idea together we will make it a big success and all of us whoever invests and I will all become very very rich and I tell you put your money in my business and I will return it to you multiplied many times 25 years from today would you be interested chances are doesn't matter how attractive the investment proposition may be you would probably refuse why what will put you off is Anil 25 years you say I have the money today I can put it today but what if I need it a year down the line two years down the line five years down the line you say sorry 
but imagine i came to you and i said you know here's this great investment opportunity put your money your money my ideas we'll all become rich and folks whenever you want your money back i will return it to you would you not be far more inclined towards investing this is what the stock market does it gives you an exit route when you have the money invest whenever you want it back you pick up the phone and tell the broker sell and you get your money back you may not get what you invested you might sometimes get a little more sometimes little less but bulk of it can come back but imagine you tell the broker sell my shares because i want my money back and the broker goes to sell in the stock market and he doesn't find a buyer why because there is lackluster activity on the stock exchange the whole logic goes out of the window folks i am trying to tell you when more of us are stock market investors that market is teeming with activity when the market is teeming with activity every time a buyer will be able to find a seller a seller will be able to find a buyer when buyers and sellers find it easier to locate each other more people are inclined towards investing when more people are inclined towards investing more entrepreneurs are born who are entrepreneurs they are those wonderful people who are brimming with ideas who intelligent people they are born because they can find people are more willing to invest when people are more willing to invest more entrepreneurs are born more industry is created more employment is generated more production happens more gdp happens the nation prospers and where did the whole thing start where you and i said we are willing to invest in stock stocks investing in stocks is a national duty and to and to and to illustrate my point i always say Uh, you know you will never ever come across a developed country with an underdeveloped stock market that means there is a distinct connection between the nation's development and the stock market development i don't know what led to what but there is a distinct connection folks if you and i can't directly contribute to nation development we can indirectly do it by being investors in the stock market but having said that i also feel i'd rather you don't invest then invest foolishly because a foolish investor is a very dangerous person he jumps into it without thinking burns his fingers comes out number 1 cursing the stock exchange and number 2 dissuades several others who are planning to invest you know you don't make that mistake i did it and i lost money that kind of person is very dangerous before you start investing learn the rudiments so this book in a way is part of my desire to see that large number of people invest but intelligently invest yes there are risks it is not free from risk but understand risk risks can be managed in fact while i talk about risk you know i'm going to just drift along okay while i said risk i i have a very different take on risk also <laughs> lots of people say stock market is risky i say yes it is risky but show me a safe investment Didn't the people who invest with, invested with PMC Bank think they are safe? Were they safe? Risk is everywhere. I have said often said that people invest on grounds of safety when they don't understand anything about safety except the spelling. Stock market is risky, yes. But folks, in the stock market, what you can earn in a short period of time in those safe investments, you may not earn in a life. at what cost safety and even when you think they are safe they are not safe had you asked the finest brains in the world what do you think of enron in october 2001 had you asked who the best brains in the world by that i mean the merrill lynch's and the goldman sachs of the world what do you think of enron when october 2001 folks without exception everybody was saying Number one, there hasn't been a company like Enron in the entire century. Number two, without exception, they were putting a buy recommendation against Enron. Folks, December two thousand one, the company didn't exist anymore. Are you and I qualified to judge safety? When you choose investments on grounds of safety, you have not guaranteed safety for yourself. 
but what you have guaranteed for yourself is mediocrity of returns mediocrity of return guaranteed safety not guaranteed folks if there is going to be a risk anyhow and there is a direct relationship between risk and return then might as well consciously go into risky ventures and at least enjoy the proportionately higher returns i am not saying go and risk all your money but folks maybe consciously you should put 10 20% of your money year mark for risky investments but manage those risks you just might find in the 10 50 20% of your portfolio the return that you're getting are greater than what you're getting on the rest of your 80% of portfolio so this is one more argument in favor of investing in stocks you know i said i'm not a <clears throat> i'm not a broker i don't make money by giving services or advice on stock market so i have no vested interest in trying to sell stock market uh, as a mode of investment to you but but let me uh, qualify that statement many years back when i passed out as a chartered accountant i set up practice and that is the first time i started uh, harshil i'll come to your question let's compile all the questions and i'll answer them together at the end so there's a continuous flow uh, you know i started in first time i ever invested was after becoming a ca and uh, those days if somebody would ask you or ask me suggest a full proof method of investing one would normally say you know start with the primary market what is the primary market when you invest in public issues ipos those days i no longer suggest that those days wonderful companies used to come out with public issue of shares and a 10 rupee share would be sold for 10 rupees and if they charge a premium it would be 2 rupees 3 rupees 5 rupees 10 rupees not the crazy premiums like they have today so my answer used to be you want to make your investment fool proof fool proof doesn't go with the word investment hand in hand the nothing is guaranteed fool proof but as fool proof as possible so my res- response used to be start with the public issue but what happened was when excellent shares were available of 10 rupee shares for 10 or 15 obviously those issues used to be oversubscribed heavily oversubscribed and when an issue is oversubscribed whether you will get allotment or not was like a lottery so if you invest in a good company's public issue chances are very strong that your application gets rejected and money would come back i would suggest then next public issue put it again it may come back then next put it again at least if you apply for three four issues at least once you will get it folks imagine you managed to get 1 lakh rupees worth of shares allotted it was not uncommon that in a sh- the moment the share get listed for trading in the stock market a 10 rupee share would be trading for 50 rupees 80 rupees 100 rupees that was a very common thing those days So my response used to be you want to make your investing foolproof start with the public issue let's say if you get 1 lakh rupees worth of investment a shares allotted to you the day it get listed if it get listed 10 rupee share at 50 sell don't wait don't regret if it goes up later so 1 lakh rupees you can sell for 5 lakhs or 4 lakhs or 3 lakhs then my suggestion was remove your original 1 lakh out now your investment is zero out of pocket now take the profits earned from there and go to the secondary market even if it is risky even if you lose the whole thing you have earned only from the stock market and then if you start so that used to make it full proof so i remember my own first investment let me share that with you i don't think i've written about that in the book i had applied for a company called skf there's a company in pune where i live called skf s KF that is a ball bearings company i'm not talking about that there was a pharmaceutical company called E S K A Y E F S S S K F now i think later on it became s smith klein become uh, uh, joined hands with them or something now s k f i remember they had come out with a 10 rupees share at an 8 rupees princely premium of 8 rupees so you had to invest 18 rupees uh and and the and the terms were you were supposed to put 50% on application 50% if you get allotted 
So you were supposed to put nine rupees first. Now you know what people did? Not really the right thing to do because to improve your chances of allotment, you're not allowed to make multiple applications. So what one would do is make multiple applications within the family. So I, I remember I applied for 100 shares for myself and I applied 50 in my mom's name, 50 in my dad's name. So 200 shares is what? Don't look at the amounts, gentlemen. Look at the percentages as I go ahead. Amounts are ridiculously small now. For me, they were big amounts then. I just about started practicing. So 200 I'd applied. You were supposed to pay 9 now and 9 later. So 200 into 9, my total investment was 18. Uh, 1800 right as luck would have it beginners luck you may call it for my application of 100 shares I was allotted 50 50 were rejected out of my mom and dad's application one of them I forget which was uh, got allotment one got rejected in a nutshell I was allotted a hundred shares of SKF at 18 rupees each my total investment in SKF was 1800 you know, before the shares get listed, there are rumors in the stock market at what price will it get listed. The rumors swirling around SKF were it will get listed at 80 rupees. And very often these rumors only determine the price and it actually got listed at 80 within a couple of months, mind you. So I paid 18 and it got listed at 80. I was a beginner, newcomer. I was thrilled, but not that I was thrilled enough to sell and in cash. I looked at the price and I was getting happy looking at the newspaper. Next day it went up to 90. Soon it went up to 100. It went up to 120, 140, 150, 160. It went up to 180. And I was counting my profits on paper. Then it started falling again. And it came down to 160, 150. You know, before you sell, it's fallen further. Before you sell, it's fallen further. It came down back to 80. I said, no, I'm losing whatever I've made. Fortunately, I sold 50 of my shares. Now look at the percentages, guys. Don't look at the amounts. I didn't, my total investment was 1800. I sold 50 shares for 4000. My investment out of pocket was zero. It started moving up again. It went back to 180 very soon. Then I sold the remaining 50. So I sold for 4050 shares and I sold for 39,000 the other 50, 1,800 rupees invested, 13,000 return, all in a matter of about three months. So that was my initiation into the stock market. I said, wow, this is a wonderful place. And then what happened was, uh, I was not a broker and all, but I had a friend who was a sub broker. And this guy was a cerebral kind of a person. He used to enjoy, I used to enjoy chatting with him. He used to come to my office from time to time. We used to chat. When I ask him about any company, he'll give me the whole history, the insides and the outsides. So, so, so it was a pleasure to chat with him. So in short, what happened? I said, I don't do anything in stock market, but in a short period I did. He and I set up for those days, maybe the first fully computerized portfolio management service giving tax linked advice and this sounds very impressive this was among the first of its kind those days but how did we do it i was i think amongst the first chartered accountants in my town to own a pc i didn't know what to do with it but i had one so i had a pc so that could allow me to give personalized advice because we could create a database in our system of all the clients uh, and we used to give tax link because they, this was a partnership between a sub broker and a chartered accountant. So I could probably tell you, you know, you're getting a good price, but this is the month of March. I suggest wait a little bit. Let's wait till April. Let the year change and maybe your short term capital gain will become long term capital gain. And even though price may fall, but you'll save in taxes, etc. So it was a it was an advice mixed with finance and taxation. Fully computerized because I owned a PC tax link portfolio management service. Now, how did it work? It was a subscription based thing. You pay a small, ridiculously small subscription and you become a member. And when you become a member, you give us a list of your shares that you hold. So we feed it into our database. This friend of mine used to come out every fortnight 
with a list of share that you should be buying and a list of share that you should be exiting. Now buying is good for everybody. It can't be individual. What is good for you, not good for you. That doesn't happen. So for buying, we used to come out with a newsletter. All our members used to receive. This is what we recommend you buy. For selling, he'd come out with a list of share. These shares should be sold. Now only those clients who hold those shares will be told and a database used to throw up those clients names. So they would get a personal phone call from us. I think you should exit. So it was a very personalized service, tax link, portfolio management, fascinating thing. Simple and fascinating. Those days, this friend of mine was recommending a stock called Mazda. Mazda Industries it used to be. And later on became Mazda Leasing or vice versa. It was Mazda Leasing, it became Mazda Industries, one of the two. Mazda was sold those days at 14, 15 rupees and it was tipped to touch 100. Very dangerous word in stock market. Tipped to touch 100 and this friend of mine was also recommending buy Mazda, it should go up to 100. And we were not merely recommending to our clients, we used to practice what we preached. So we were telling others buy Mazda and we were buying Mazda ourselves. So at 14, 15, this friend of mine said, you should buy Mazda, our clients bought, I bought, my friend bought, price went up to about 25. Buy Mazda, that tip to touch 100. Others bought, we bought, price went up to 40 or 45. Again, buy, it'll go up to 100. And then one of the stock market crashes came. What happens when the stock markets crash? Folks, everything crashes. Whether it deserves to crash or doesn't deserve to crash. What happens in a boom? Everything goes up. Whether it deserves to go up or doesn't deserve to go up. So discerning investors, what they, what they do? When stock markets crash and everything crashes, whether it deserves or not, as is happening, should have happened. Now market is going up against all logic. But when it falls, You'll have a great time to pick up shares which have fallen, which didn't deserve to fall. Wonderful blue chip shares were available at dirt cheap prices. This is what you should do now. Hopefully market should crash again because in all this bad news in the world, why on earth is the market going up? So, and in boom times when markets go up, even those which don't deserve to go up, go up. That's the time you get an opportunity to get rid of the junk that you have collected along the way. So market crashed, everything crashed and along with our good old Mazda also crashed. It came down to some six or seven rupees. I realized this is not my cup of tea. We sold the company. We told everybody we're not providing these services anymore. And that was the first and last uh, activity I did in providing some services in the field of uh, stock market. But then what happened? For my personal portfolio, we used to have a very primitive system in my office. We had a full scape sheet where vertically all the shares that I owned we used to list and full scape sheet per month. So January and horizontally we had 1 to 31 listed over there. And I never looked at the stock market on a daily basis. I'm not that much into it. I watch it depending on how busy I am. If So when I'm very busy with other work for a long time, I would not see. When I get some time, I would probably pour on it every day. But somebody in the office was given a job that every day when the newspaper comes, you'd write down the prices of our shares. So the, you open the full scape sheet, January 1 to 31, at a glance you'll see against this, the price. It tells you whether the price is going up or coming down. Very primitive for those days it was a system. And whenever I open the sheet, Mazda, yours was a steady line of 6 rupees, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6 throughout. Some years passed, 1, 2, 3 years passed. One day I opened that file and Mazda had gone up to 8. So wow, suddenly you can notice it's 6, 6, 6 and suddenly it moves up. I said, there's a movement in Mazda. Why? Next day, 10. Following day, 11 or 12. Following day, 15. Following day, 18. I said, wow, what's happening? And the next day, a letter comes by mail from Mazda. Mazda rights issue and suddenly you put two and two together all right all right you know this is a company what is the assumption they have a rights issue of shares they are selling 10 rupee shares for 10 rupees each to existing shareholders why would anybody want to buy Mazda shares for 10 rupees when in the market it's available for six rupees so the company is rigging up the price 
so that when you compare companies offering for 10 rupees in the stock market it is for 15 16 17 18 so the rights issue will become a success so you put two and two together you said this is cheating tear the mazda letter and throw it into the dustbin i'm now trying to point out to you the price you pay sometimes when you assume things you don't do research following day mazda became 20 and then it became 25 then it became 30, then it became 35, then it became 40. He said, listen, enough. We've recovered all our... Uh, I'll come to the answers together, right? Navdeep, uh, later on, uh, we'll answer the questions. So I said, you know, we've recovered our investment because I had bought from prices ranging from 15 to 45. So my average price was well below 40. So you're recovering the interest cost and waiting costs and everything. I said, I think it's time to get out because it went to 40. But one principle I follow is don't sell in a rising market. Sell when the rising stops and it starts to fall. Sell at the beginning of the fall. Don't buy in a falling market. Let the falling complete and let it start rising again. Time to buy is at the beginning of the rising phase. So it's, maybe I'll elaborate later. So it went up from 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 42, 43, then fell a little, came to 40. I said, I think we should sell. It started falling. But I didn't sell all. Sell some of it. And it started rising again. Went up to 45, 50, 55, 60, 70, 75. And then it hit a plateau again and fell a little bit. Now I said, genuinely enough, let's sell the lot and get out. Recovered all my investment. And then Mazda continued to rise. It went up to 80 and then 100 and 150 and then 200 and 300 and 400 and it went up to 1500. <laughs> and you know what had happened? Harshad Mehta had invested into Mazda and I didn't bother to find out. What a price you pay when you go by assumptions. And those days, anything Harshad Mehta used to touch used to go up. <laughs> so these are some interesting stories around it. They're all there in the book. Uh, if you if you read, I've interspersed the um, explanation about market with uh, these stories. You know, if 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 I have to give you some meaningful input, how to be a successful investor? If you haven't invested so far, if you're a beginner, then in my opinion, you need to understand two things. That's it. What do you need to understand to be a successful investor? You need to understand what. And you need to understand when. What does what mean? What means what to buy? What does when mean? When means when to buy and when to sell. What depends upon your ability to do something known as fundamental analysis. And when depends upon your ability to do what is known as technical analysis. Now, fundamental analysis can be a long process, but I have given you a shortcut in the book that if you don't understand fundamental analysis, do this much. It will, that should give you good enough idea. Once you do fundamental analysis and find this company is fundamentally strong, what should you do now? Don't pick up the phone and tell the broker buy. Because even more important is when. When to buy, when to sell. And for that, you've got to do technical analysis. Technical is a quite a technical area. And ideally, you should know a friend who's into stock market investing, who's a broker, who's an advisor, who understands technical analysis. That friend would be invaluable to have. But today, fortunately, lots of technical analysis is done by for you and put up. If you go to moneycontrol.com, go to another site called marketsmojo.com, you know, you'll get all this done for you readily. Please look these up and uh, you'll find a lot of information. Uh, let me ask you a simple question about technical. You see, technical, to give you a very crude technical analysis, I wish I had a presentation I could have run you through it. But if you plot a graph of price movement, what will the graph look like? You know, today you'll find the share is here. Next day it will jump here. Following day it will fall, again it will go up, again it will fall, again it will go up, again it will fall. And you will start wondering, if you watch a share for a long enough time, you will start wondering, this is a crazy place. 
this market doesn't know should i go up or should i come down it's a confused place if i bought the share if it goes up before i have time to be happy it has fallen before i am properly depressed it has gone up again this market is crazy but you watch it for a long enough time you will be able to see some sense in this nonsense you will find that the price is here and it goes up here and it comes down and it goes up again but the bottom it touched now is higher than the earlier bottom the peak that it touched now is higher than the earlier peak if successive bottoms and peaks are higher than each other it will mean the market is in a rising phase if a price goes up and falls and goes up and falls but when when it went up this time and second time when it went up the peak was lower than earlier peak this fall is lower than earlier fall when successive tops and successive bottoms are lower than each other it means the market is in a falling phase what i'm trying to tell you is in a rising phase there will be intermittent falls in a falling phase there will be periodic upswings what you need to learn is how to distinguish with daily movements from a trend in a rising trend there will be falls in a falling trend there will be rises what is important is the trend so i'll give you a simple example and try and see if i can explain it without uh, even a presentation imagine today a share price is here at 20 bucks then it goes up to 30 then it falls to 25 goes up to 40 falls a bit goes up falls a bit goes up touches a peak of 90 then the falling trend starts goes up falls goes up falls goes up comes back to 20 so it was at 20 went up to 90 came back to 20 and if i ask you a theoretical question given a choice at what price would you like to buy this share at what price would you like to sell it obviously you will say i would love to buy it at 20 and sell it at 90 then why does it not happen more people would have bought at 90 and sold at 20 so the question is when i ask you a theoretical question you give me a sensible answer then what goes wrong when you go to invest so let's understand how does the psychology of an average investor work why does he do the reverse correct jay you should buy at 20 and sell at 90 why does it why the, does the reverse happen You see, when the price is at twenty, what is the thinking of the average investor? The average investor says this is a low price share. You see, you don't demand supply decide the price. When demand is more, price goes up. When supply is more, price falls. So the average investor's reasoning is: Why is this price at twenty? Why is it a low price share? That means more people must be selling, less people must be buying. so the logic applied is if everybody is selling why should i buy something must be wrong with this share isn't it he doesn't do his own thinking he doesn't do his own research at 20 he doesn't buy and i think is fair enough even i am not recommending that you start buying every share which is low because even third grade shares will be low price so when the price but we you and i have the benefit of foresight this share will go to 90 correct so when it is at 20 the average investor doesn't take any interest the price goes up to 30 what is the reaction of the average investor no reaction why because where it went up is not important because it will fall what is important is when it falls will it stop above that previous 20 or go below you see in a rising trend what happens upswings are stronger than downswings in a falling trend upswings are weak downswings are strong so 20 he doesn't buy 30 he doesn't buy 30 falls to 25 and jumps up to 40 now two bottoms and two tops are higher than each other now when it reaches 40 what does he do maybe this average investor wakes up oh did i miss the bus the share was available at 20 i didn't buy now it's become 40 he doesn't have the guts to pick up the phone and say bye mental resolution gets modified i think this share deserves to be watched next time it reaches 20 i'll be the first one to buy 40 is too high how can i buy for 40 what was available for 20 just a few days back 40 it falls a little bit and goes up to 50 when it goes up to 50 this guy says what a mistake 
I would have made such a huge profit. Then it goes up to 60. Now the average investor says, what am I doing here? I didn't buy at 20, understandable. At 30, I could have bought. At 40, I could have bought. It's gone up to 60. Mental resolution is modified. I won't wait for this share to drop to 20. Even 30 is good. Even 40 is good. It's gone up to 60. 60 doesn't have the courage to buy. 60 falls a bit and goes up to 70. Every day it goes up, he kicks himself, what a mistake I've made. 70 becomes 80, 80 becomes 90. By the time it reaches 90, this fellow says, every day that I have delayed my buying decision, I have lost an opportunity to make profit. Let me learn my lesson somewhere. In the past, if I have made mistake, let me now take some action, picks up the phone, tell the broker, buy for me also. What was this person impressed by? This person was impressed by the stock market performance of this company, not by the shop floor performance of the company, not by the marketplace performance of the company where they sell their goods and products. It is impre he is impressed by the stock market performance. Folks, if you're going to get impressed by the stock market performance of a share, when the share performs better, you are impressed. It performs even better, you are more impressed. When it reaches the peak, you are impressed enough to pick up the phone and tell the broker, buy for me. Now, unfortunately for him, he has bought at the peak. Next day, the share falls. What is the average person's reaction? He is thrilled. Last time from 80, it fell a bit, jumped up to 90. Now from 90, it will fall a bit and next jump will take it above 100. But unfortunately for him, downward trend has started. In a downward trend, what happens? Down swings are stronger, up swings are weaker. So 90 falls to 80, 80 goes up to 85 and comes to 70. A human beings are masters at self-deception. This fellow will convince himself, you know, it's not a machine, one up, one down, one up, one down. Sometimes it can be two downs and one up. Next jump will take it up. He started praying. He goes to the temple and breaks a coconut. Folks in the stock market, praying will not help. You need to take action. Now 70 goes up a bit and comes down to 60. Now this guy is scared. <laughs> he says, I knew all along this is a lousy share. I should have trusted my instinct. Why did I get into it? Now, famous last words of these people. You know, I don't mind losing a little bit of money. This share I bought at 90, even if it goes up to 80, I'll get out. But I can't buy at 90 and sell at 60 in such a short period of time. He doesn't have the courage to sell at 60. 60 goes up a bit and falls to 50. Then he says, 60 is also okay, but 50 is too low. Next day it falls to 40 and 30 and 20. By the time it touches 20, this fellow says, let me sell and get whatever 5, 10 rupees I can get and comes out of the stock exchange, cursing the stock exchange. This is no place for respectable people. This is a gambler's den and this and that. Folks, what is the fault of the stock market? Whose fault is it? It is this fellow's fault. But he says, what's my fault? Are you saying my fault is I got impressed but prices are going up? Are you saying I should be impressed if prices are falling? Should I buy in a falling market? Answer is no. Please buy in a rising market. But buy at the beginning of the rise, not at the end of the rise. Please sell in a falling market. But buy at the, sell at the beginning of the fall, not at the end of the fall. These are a few things I've explained in greater detail in the book. I don't know how much time I have. It's already 7.40. My God, I didn't realize. Let me see some questions. Uh, would you advise convest, continue investing in mutual funds? You know, first of all, I'm more in favor of direct investment in stocks. But yes, in mutual funds, if you are, are an investor in stock market, then mutual funds kind of evens out your risk. And if the markets fall, and if you have an SIP, then please stay invested because that's where you get a chance of averaging it out that yes, I would advise invest in mutual fund, but sensibly. How can a beginner who knows nothing about stock market learn about it? Jay, read the book, Flirting with Stocks. <laughs> you, you'll probably get enough knowledge to uh, invest. Any lessons from hedge fund Nasser Nicholas Taleb? Nicholas Taleb is an amazing guy. You should read his books. All I can tell you is he is a wonderful writer. Uh, but right now I can't talk about. We are supposed to talk about flirting with stocks and not Nicholas Taleb's books. Kaustu. Uh, 
is it advisable for a newcomer to start investing yes uh, navneet uh, mutual funds like i said if you can't invest directly then rather than not invest go to mutual funds but personally i have a soft corner for direct investing mutual fund but it's okay some people say i don't have time i don't understand and therefore i will not invest no 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 don't stay away then come via mutual funds but be have make your presence felt in the stock market praveen hindi book uh, is not there yet uh, marathi book is almost ready i think after covid it will be released but hindi uh, also is in the pipeline but it's not out yet uh Okay, guys. If there are any more questions, you can ask, or let me share another story with you, and then wind up today's session. You know, in the stock market, what is the basic logic? What is the basic philosophy? Basic philosophy is all of us should have the same information. Either we should have, or all of us should have access to the same information. And then our our reaction is different. uh you get the same balance sheet i get the same balance sheet i look at that balance sheet and say wow i should buy you look at that balance sheet and say i should sell and then one of us is right one of us is wrong one of us make profit one of us make losses it's okay but folks what should not happen is that you are given a different information and i know something else and who am i i am an insider i know something else you have been fed some other information and you will be told what i know later so you are reacting to the information fed to you i know something and then when you come to know what i know market will go up that's where i will sell i bought it when i only i knew and sell it later this is called insider trading for example i am the managing director of my company imagine and there's a merger happening when the world comes to know merger is happening price will shoot up so i buy the shares now before anybody knows and when the merger announcement is made you like the, you get impressed you also buy that is when i'm selling that is insider trading insider trading is frowned upon everywhere but very little is done to curb it in the sense it difficult to prove because insider is not only let's say the md the auditor is an insider the md is nephew md could have told him but how do you prove the nephew might say i bought it on my own gut feeling how can you say my uncle told me so it's very difficult to prove insider trading there were laws in many countries uk has had laws for many years us has had laws prosecution percentage very small in india there were no laws merrill lynch is on record having said in india only insider trading happens some years back sebi passed a law called abolition of insider trading act now i used to write my weekly columns in the newspapers and every week the problem used to be what to write on so when such laws come in it gives you material to write on so i was doing some research when this law came out and i was trying to find some of the earliest cases of insider trading and i came across one case not strictly insider trading but interesting to share with you and after that story will stop folks this is something that happened today we are in 2020 it happened 200 and 5 years ago <laughs> 1815 anybody with a history background if you know what happened in 1815 i will tell you a war was going on battle was going on the battle of waterloo was going on. the battle of waterloo between duke of wellington of england great britain and napoleon bonaparte of france now why is this battle important because if you take your mind back 200 years you see today the superpower is usa then the superpower was great britain today power lies in arms and ammunition and guns nuclear then power lay in trading ability funnily england had a trading company called east india company and by virtue of a trading company they were ruling over many parts of the world and along the way france had started becoming powerful napoleon was a young soldier was leading battles in the 18th century 1790s 
leading battle after battle and winning. I think closer to 1800, 1799 or something, he gave himself the Kitab of Emperor. And then in early 1800s continued the attacks and then made the tactical blunder of invading Russia in peak winter and lost thousands of soldiers. Then he withdrew, beat a retreat, went into hibernation for a few years, then emerged from hibernation, started attacking again. And by 1815, when, by the time the Battle of Waterloo was being fought, this was a very decisive battle in that had Napoleon won the Battle of Waterloo, the global power balance would have shifted in favor of France. And what would happen then? My topic is stock market. So what would be the impact on the London Stock Exchange when they hear what has happened at Waterloo? Folks, if England would have lost, London Stock Market would have collapsed. And if England would have won, it would have regained supremacy, market would have gone up. Many people get surprised, 1815 London Stock Exchange existed, definitely existed. I think somewhere in 1860s or so, Bombay Stock Exchange had started, right? So the investors in London were very worried. You see, battle was being fought at Waterloo, far away from London. And this is 1815, no BBC, no cable TV, no satellite, internet. What will happen in one part of the world, other part of the world would come to know maybe I don't know, 48 hours, 72 hours later. But those days there was a family still there called the House of Roth Rothschild or House of Rothschild. I am told more appropriate is Rothschild. House of Rothschild still there. They were bankers, barons, business people, diverse business interests across Europe. And their wealth was made due to their, largely to their ability to learn of world events before others. They used to have their personal communication network, including carrier pigeons, which would bring news to them from one part of the world to, the, to them. And they would learn of world events before others and make a killing out of it. You see, before internet, internet has, cleaned, uh, has, has created a level playing field. But before that, if you could learn before anybody else, you could make a profit. And the head of the Rothschild family in London those days was a person called Nathan Rothschild. So everybody in London knew Nathan will come to know before us what is happening at Waterloo. So the logic applied was watch Nathan. What does it mean? That means if Nathan starts buying, it will mean England has won. And if Nathan starts selling, it will mean England has lost. So everybody was watching Nathan. Nath, I think the battle was fought on 18 June 1815. It was a Sunday. Nathan did come to know one day before the rest of England that England has won. So next morning, 19 June, when the stock market opened, they call it the Black Monday. Nathan uh, Rothschild, instead of buying, started selling. So what was the perception of people? England has lost. London stock market collapsed. They call it the Black Monday. And when the market reached rock bottom, he started buying. There's a phrase in stock market which says the time to buy is when blood is flowing in the streets. Blood was flowing. And this phrase is attributed to Nathan Rothschild. Blood was flowing in the streets and when it read rock bottom he bought and in one day he made a profit of today's equivalent of I think seven, eight hundred million dollars. So I was writing in that article, had he done it now, they would jail him for insider trading even though this is not strictly insider trading. Folks, I just wanted to share a few things about stock market, see if I can generate a spark of interest in you and of course if you wish to learn more, the book flirting with stocks is there feel free to please place an order for it good time during this covid lockdown to use to enhance your knowledge etc so these were a few things i wanted to share i think i have definitely overshot my time but don't forget i had warned you before i started i'm a teacher at heart so once you start it becomes difficult to stop so guys do you think we should bring this to the end If any last minute questions are there, I'll be happy to answer. Harshil, what is 1875? I don't understand.
All right, in case there are no more questions, it was a great pleasure talking to you. Stay safe. Invest wisely. I hope you make a lot of profit. Good night, everyone.